Well, this is the sixth time I have had the opportunity to provide uh, an update to the people of New York City on the preliminary budget for the upcoming year. Uh, I want to say at the outset, the word preliminary is very, very pertinent in this case. Never has the word preliminary been so appropriate in my previous uh, five years because we're dealing with some very unusual circumstances here, which I'll go into. So uh, this is um, our effort at this moment in time to say how we will proceed as a city against an uncertain backdrop. Uh, clearly, we'll be back in a couple of months with the executive budget, hopefully having a lot more uh, solid information at that point to act upon. But the reason for the uncertainty, there's three specific challenges we face. The first and the greatest is our overall economic situation. Uh, the uh, national economy is at a point that is uncertain. Uh, we are seeing the impact of that reality on our revenue already. Most notably, the volatility in the stock market is affecting revenue in real time, and we are very concerned about where that may take us, but we're much more concerned about the bigger trajectory of the economy and what that could mean for New York City and for our budget. Second, uh, the decisions in Albany, I'll go over them in a moment. Uh, but very specific uh, proposals already before us that would have a very substantial negative impact on New York City. And a situation in Albany is getting uh, tougher as we go along in terms of the fiscal situation. And then third, uh, uncertainty emanating from Washington, that some of that is on the policy front, for example, the trade uh, issue, but some of that is uh, more immediate. Uh, the possibility of yet another shutdown and what that would mean for us. No one is predicting it, but it is a live uh, and real possibility. So those are the kinds of things that are coming together to create an unusual level of uncertainty that we're doing our best to address in this preliminary budget. Now, depending on how each of these realities develop, uh, we well may have to uh, limit some of our investments or slow down some of our investments or in fact cut some programs and some investments outright. Uh, we have some uh, tough choices up ahead under any scenario. We will be guided uh, by the need to make hard choices, to find savings, and then when we have to choose, we will favor uh, the priorities we believe are most strategic and high impact. And if a program is nobly intended but not as strategically central or not as valuable, uh, that's where you will find the cuts. So let's uh, talk about some of these pieces. The first and most important, again, major uncertainty is the economy. Uh, more and more observers, more and more uh, key players in our national economy, particularly in the business community, are seeing signs of a recession. There's a pretty strong uh, debate right now about whether a recession is coming in 2019 or 2020, but there is a very high likelihood that it's going to be one year or the other. This country is right now in the second longest recovery ever since World War II. It is now a 116-month-long recovery. That is a very good thing. The problem is Economic history teaches us that uh, all recoveries eventually end. So by any normal measure, unfortunately, a recession is in the offing. Uh, this is a situation that a lot of people have looked at, obviously, including some of the people who predicted accurately the 2008 crash and some of the people who did not see the 2008 crash uh, coming. Uh, both sides that divide, you hear more and more voices saying some kind of slowdown is imminent. Uh, particularly notable to us was what happened in December in uh, the stock market. Uh, the month, as you will remember, began with extraordinarily troubling declines and volatility. By the end of December, we saw the biggest monthly decline in the stock market for any month since the Great Recession, so almost a, a Looking back over a 10-year period, December 2018 was the single worst month for the stock market. Again, that had a very immediate impact on our revenues. But it's unsettling that that could have happened, and we have no way of knowing if that was uh, aberrant or if we might see something like that again in the near term. 
Clearly, uh, there are major, major unresolved issues of policy that are affecting the economy, most notably on the trade front. We see a weakening housing market. Um, so there's a, a series of things that uh, cause us tremendous concern. In terms of our tax revenue, we see it slowing clearly. Uh, convert, uh, compared to last year, last year we saw a distinct uh, one-time uh, spike in revenue because of the federal tax law changes. We uh, saw that coming. We projected that. That happened. But in fact, it was one-time only. It was not expected to be recurring revenue. It proved not to be recurring revenue. Uh, what we're seeing this year is uh, particularly uh, a problem in terms of personal income tax. We have seen our uh, collections go down, uh, and now, uh, compared to projection, almost $1 billion lower than the projection that we had in place from last year. So that uh, is all substantial unto itself and immediate. The second major uncertainty is what's happening in Albany. Uh, I'll be speaking about that in greater detail on Monday when I give my budget testimony in Albany. But I do want to go over the big picture, and it certainly is cause for concern. When the governor announced his uh, budget, uh, there were almost $600 million in cuts and cost shifts for uh, the next fiscal year included. Uh, that is a very troubling starting point to the process. That includes uh, about $300 million less in education funding than we need about $125 million reduction in uh, TANF and financial assistance to families in need. Uh, and there's also an impact on shelter costs, foster care, mental health services, uh, a $59 million cut in health services, which includes a family health disease prevention and emergency preparedness, and a $13 million cut for our initiatives to keep young people out of foster care and to keep them out of uh, detention. So these are all uh, substantial pieces. Uh, we are very concerned that that was a very big hit. Remember, in recent years, we have sustained other state cuts. And these are permanent cuts. I want everyone to understand that. When these cuts occur in the state budget, it's not just for one year. The, the, the money goes away, never comes back. This is a, a very big additional hit being proposed. We're going to fight it hard. We're going to fight hard in the legislature to get as much of this reversed, reversed as possible. But uh, history shows that you know, we win some, we lose some. And so we cannot be overly optimistic when we're starting at such a substantial figure. That uh, budget proposal from the governor occurred before the announcement earlier this week, which adds concern to the situation. Earlier in the week, the governor and the state controller together announced that the state is experiencing a $2.3 billion shortfall for the current fiscal year uh, for their budget, and they project a $1.6 billion shortfall for next year. That's a problem uh, for the state, but it's also a problem for the city because that puts additional pressure on the state and leads to choices that, again, could directly or indirectly hurt the city. So we are braced for uh, potential additional problems uh, when the governor announces his updated budget. Third and last is the situation in Washington. A year ago when I presented the uh, preliminary budget, I talked about uh, a manufactured crisis in Washington. Uh, we had a different version of that uh, this year with the shutdown. We saw the negative impact of the shutdown on the economy. Uh, we saw how much money was wasted as a result of the shutdown. We obviously know there is a possibility of another shutdown. Again, I am hopeful that the lessons learned a few weeks ago will prevail and that it won't come to that. But we have to be sober about the fact that there's nothing that has changed appreciably in the President's position, and so we may be facing uh, that danger. Again, reminding people to central elements to the dangerous shutdown that we need to think about in terms of this presentation, the most important one, the impact on everyday New Yorkers. Uh, once a shutdown occurs, if it were to occur at this upcoming deadline, by May, New, York, New Yorkers would be losing about half a billion dollars a month in direct support, uh, things like food stamps and school lunches and a variety of things that directly affect our people. Also, the city government would be losing about $110 million each month. 
that would add up if it went on for a year to $1.2 billion. I don't predict that. I am not trying to offer a, a doomsday scenario. I'm just trying to ground us in the real dynamics of what a shutdown means. If it happened again and it continued to set new records for longevity, there are real immediate uh, dangers to our budget. Obviously, we're going to work very hard with our representatives in Washington to do all we can to avert such a situation. So when you add up those three challenges and you say, okay, what does it mean in terms of the decisions that uh, we brought to bear for this preliminary budget? It means that we have decided to institute a PEG program, a program to eliminate the gap in the budget. This is the first ever PEG program under this administration. We have constructed it in a way that we think is sensible. It is not the same approach taken uh, in past administrations, but it is the same. Uh, it shares the goal of mandatory savings being required from each agency. Uh, the overall uh, game plan is this. I'll talk about some other savings we have already achieved and some ongoing savings, but this is additive. These are additional savings that we must find basically in the next two months. The goal is, and it is a, when I say goal, this, everyone will be held to this. It must appear in the executive budget. There will be an additional $750 million in savings that we will find in the next two months. We will use a variety of tools to get to $750 million. One of those will be expanding our hiring freeze. We will focus the hiring freeze now not just on where there are vacancies but on our use of attrition. And where there is attrition, there will not be a guarantee that lines will be filled or filled immediately. Obviously, there will be major exceptions for uh, particularly vital services. But we're going to focus on uh, expanding the hiring freeze as a central piece. But the piece that is most important is the PEG program. Every agency will be given a specific dollar goal they must meet. It will be individualized to the agency. Uh, this will be a very straightforward exercise. Every agency will be required to come up with real and tangible savings. Uh, uh, bar will be set high to ensure those are the kinds of savings that we need. Uh, I would say at the outset, I believe every agency will respond in an appropriate fashion. But I also want to be clear, so all New Yorkers hear this, and certainly all of our colleagues in the agencies hear this, that if uh, agencies are not forthcoming with the kinds of reductions we need, the budget director, Melanie Hartzog, will herself make the decisions about what those reductions should be in each agency. So now I want to just outline the overall uh, preliminary budget. And this is a good moment to thank uh, everyone who has spent so much time uh, preparing this budget. And, and we're all getting prepared for the long months ahead in this process. I want to thank, of course, our Deputy Mayor, starting with First Deputy Mayor Dean Foulihan and Deputy Mayor for Operations Laura Anglin, our Deputy Mayor for Housing and Economic Development Alicia Glenn, and Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services Erminia Palacio, our Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives Phil Thompson. I want to thank my Chief of Staff Emma Wolf, my Chief Policy Advisor Don Williams, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs John Paul Lupo, and of course, our Budget Director Melanie Hartzog and everyone at OMB who have done uh, their typical outstanding work in preparing for this uh, announcement. Also want to thank uh, Speaker Corey Johnson and Finance Chair Danny Drum. We've been working very closely with them and their staff as well as we led up to today. The uh, number, I want to start this piece of the presentation with the most important uh, point, which is the actual uh, number of this proposed budget. The fiscal 2020 preliminary budget will be $92.2 billion. There has been a substantial growth since June, and that is related to several things that are very specific. Uh, the two biggest are the labor agreements that we have uh, come to with uh, some of the biggest unions in the city and has obviously set the pattern for all unions. Those labor agreements have added about a billion dollars uh, since uh, the adopted budget from last year. So. We've had about a $3 billion overall increase. That is about a third of it. Another uh, $632 million, if I'm getting it right, is in education. The number one 
element within that, about half of that is additional special ed spending, so around $300 million, uh, reaching uh, many families who were not getting the special ed services they deserved previously. Uh, important part of that is uh, our 3K initiative, which we have been expanding. Another part is mandatory charter payments, which again are an area of concern because this is uh, a mandate from Albany that is costing more and more money and is uh, one of the reasons why the budget is growing. Uh, we can go into other details as to uh, other elements uh, when our budget director gives her presentation. Now, I want to remind people, before the announcement today related to the $750 million in uh, additional savings that must be determined by the executive budget, and that includes the PEG program and the expansion of the hiring freeze, we already had uh, required agencies to find uh, substantial savings. The preliminary savings program is $1 billion for fiscal 19, fiscal 20. The $750 million is on top of that. Uh, and also important to say that the health care savings also separate, $1.6 billion in fiscal 20, $1.9 billion in fiscal 21, and that will continue for every year thereafter at that $1.9 billion level. So th there's the, the main body of our savings program, there's the health care savings, and the additional $750 million in new savings, including the PEG. Uh, those are three distinct elements that all point in the same direction, finding savings so we can uh, keep our services at uh, existing levels to the maximum extent possible. In terms of reserves, we are holding steady with our reserves at this moment. Uh, total reserves, 5.75 billion. That's one billion in the general reserve, 250 million in the capital stabilization reserve, 4.5 billion in the retiree health benefits trust fund, and the vast majority of that, about 3.6 billion because the budget action is taken in the course of this administration and, and working very closely with the council. There are a few things to talk about in terms of investments, but what is generally true is this is a, a preliminary uh, budget presentation in which there will be fairly uh, small new investments and relatively few new investments. This is the smallest amount of new investment uh, at any point in the last six years, uh, and that is uh, an indicator of the situation we're facing. Uh, one of the areas we've invested in consistently, and these investments have unquestionably paid off, uh, is in the area of public safety. We are obviously the safest big city in America. Uh, wouldn't change a dime of how we've used uh, our money in terms of those investments. Uh, one of the areas that we still need to do better in is in terms of preparing our officers to handle mental health challenges, to handle emotionally disturbed uh, individuals. So we're accelerating our crisis intervention training. It's proved to be very effective. We want to make sure it reaches all officers who are most likely because of their duties to encounter emotionally disturbed individuals. Uh, the plan we now have accelerated will have, has had already a number of officers trained, but all such officers will be trained by the end of 2021. The cost in uh, fiscal 20 will be $5.3 million. The uh, question of affordability uh, takes many forms. Obviously, I'd say in many ways the number one issue in this city, uh, what we're focusing on in this budget, we're obviously continuing a lot of our previous initiatives, but the new one we announced, the State of the City, gets at the cost of health care at the 600,000 New Yorkers who are uninsured. And we have uh, created a plan that will guarantee health care for all New Yorkers. Uh, NYC Care will reach about 300,000 New Yorkers who are not eligible for insurance. Our public option, Metro Plus, will reach, uh, we believe, uh, as many as 300,000. The remaining pool of those who are eligible but uninsured, we have a very aggressive outreach effort already underway. The investment is $25 million for fiscal 20. That ramps up to $100 million per year by fiscal 22. Another area we're focused on in terms of affordability and equity is in terms of transportation. We all understand uh, people need to get around to get to opportunity, and for so many New Yorkers of real limited means, this is a huge challenge. That's why we're continuing our commitment to the Fair Fares Initiative. It is ramping up uh, consistently. Uh, we are putting $106 million into uh, the preliminary budget for fiscal 20. 
as we continue to build that program and evaluate the real costs. In terms of uh, education efforts, we're building out uh, priorities that we have already set and accelerating uh, in the area of 3K, investing $25 million in fiscal 20 to add a new district in the Bronx, District 8, a new district in Brooklyn, District 32. This is almost 2,000 new 3K seats. With this additional investment, we will have a total of 20,000 of our three-year-olds in 3K this September. And that means uh, 14 districts uh, will be represented by uh, September of 2020 that I've already been committed to. It's almost half of our districts. And that will include our 10 highest need districts. Another point on addressing a, a really uh, profound need for New Yorkers in terms of getting around is the speed with which people get around in the area of our buses. We talked about this in the state of the city as well. We need to move our buses more quickly. We have a plan to get buses moving 25% faster. One of the key elements of that is synchronizing traffic lights at 300 intersections uh, per year, uh, 300 new intersections, I should say. That is an investment of $2.7 million per year starting uh, in the upcoming fiscal year. So those are some examples uh, of the kinds of investments that we have uh, considered critical to make here. And that talks to the expense side of the budget. I'm going to spend a very quick moment on the capital side of the budget. Uh, and obviously, we produce the 10-year uh, capital strategy uh, every two years. And so the capital plan for the upcoming period is $104.1 billion. And the focus of this plan is on a lot of the initiatives that have been underway and very effective. A huge focus, of course, on creating affordable housing. And that includes the commitments we have made to uh, our public housing, to NYCHA. A big focus on continuing efforts to protect our bridges to continue to improve our roads and repave. Uh, obviously, a focus on uh, maintaining what is uh, considered by many the finest water supply anywhere in the country, and with a lot of work, a lot we have to do to keep that in, uh, in good order. A lot of expansion of school seats. This is one of the number one issues I hear from my fellow New Yorkers. Many, many neighborhoods still experiencing overcrowding. Big commitment here to additional school seats. And of course, resiliency efforts addressing the challenge of global warming, uh, something we will uh, be committed to for many, many years to come. So uh, as I conclude, <clears throat> I'll just say a few words in Spanish and then turn to Melanie. Uh, you know, that you've all heard the truisms, uh, the truism that uh, budgets are a statement of values. Uh, that's going to play out uh, in these coming months. Uh, if we uh, get continued good news, from Washington, from Albany, from our broader economic context, uh, we'll have more freedom. If we get bad news, we'll be ready to make some very tough decisions. Uh, we will make those decisions. Some of them will be hard, but they'll be based on our strategic imperatives. And uh, that's how we'll go about uh, making sense of each one of our choices. We said, beginning of this term, the goal is to be the fairest big city in America. And one of the other things we said was, that should inform every decision. So if you have to make a choice between two programs, which one has a bigger impact on creating a, a fairer society? That's uh, the prism through which we will look. Uh, we believe if we keep ourselves uh, focused on strategic uh, matters that we can make the right choices and continue to sustain the progress in this city. Uh, but uh, we do also recognize an unusual level of uncertainty, and we're preparing for it. Few words in Spanish. El presupuesto preliminar que presentamos hoy toma en cuenta una posible reducción en ingresos y decisiones de los gobiernos estatal y federal. Nos veremos obligados a tomar, tomar decisiones difíciles para limitar, posponer o recortar nuestras inversiones. A pesar de esto, Vamos a seguir invirtiendo dentro de nuestras posibilidades para construir la ciudad grande más justa del país. 
With that, I want to turn to our budget director and thank her for her extraordinary efforts leading up to today. My pleasure to introduce Director Melanie Hartsog. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to quickly walk us through the changes since our November financial plan update and remind everybody that there's a technical briefing uh, directly after. So if we can go to the first slide here. Thank you. So as the mayor said, the fiscal year 20 preliminary budget is $92.2 billion. We closed a gap of $3.2 billion for fiscal year 20, and fiscal year 19 remains balanced. We achieved more than a billion dollars in agency savings in fiscal years 19 and 20. We've maintained our historic reserves, $5.75 billion, and continue with our cautious estimates on the revenue and debt service. And our out-year gaps are manageable, $3.52 billion in 21, and oh, going up to 3.3 billion, I'm sorry, going down to 3.3 billion in 23. So in terms of our revenue changes, while we're reflecting increased revenues in this financial plan for 19 and 20, we're also noting that tax revenue is not growing at the same rate as fiscal year 19 compared to 18. As the mayor mentioned, in fiscal year 18, we saw one-time growth of the personal income tax. We now forecast that the fiscal year 19 personal income tax revenue is projected to be about $935 million less than last year. This is partly related to lower than expected personal income tax collections in December and January. Quickly on reserves, um, just a quick note, because we're nearly through this fiscal year, we are reducing our fiscal year 19 general and capital stabilization reserves. This is a routine adjustment that we typically make in the preliminary budget. We've jumped, so I'll just quickly point out we're on the all funds slide, but for fiscal year 20 on city funds, we're at 67.9 billion, and on all funds, as I said, we're at 92.2 billion. So the next is our um, capital, 10-year capital strategy. Keep going. So this is a pie chart that breaks out our 10-year, and as you can see, our largest capital investment is in infrastructure. And finally, on debt service, just want to point out, I think this is very important, that our debt service payments do not exceed 15% of our city tax revenue. This is the benchmark for responsible capital financing. And that is it. Thank you.